We probably have more processing power like in this room, on this floor of this building, than the entire United States government did 20 years ago. Pretty obscene. We are here in a new lab space, which uh, is called the Future Interfaces Group, um, where we make new uh, interfaces and sensors to make the interactions between humans and computers better, more fluid, more natural, more powerful. So one of the kind of styles of research that we do here in the lab is what you might call time machine research, which is this notion of you kind of cobble together things that you can build today to kind of take a peek at what technologies might be like in 10 years' time. And so what it does is it lets us ask the interesting questions about what's going to actually be useful. So if we can kind of glue this prototype together and build the experience, it may be a very expensive experience, we can say, is this interesting, is this useful? And if it is interesting and useful, then that makes the case that we should actually build these devices and make them better. But until you actually build it, it's often hard to know. So if you wanted to simulate what a smartphone is like five or 10 years from now, you'd put you know, 20 smartphones or 20 computers in a closet and instead run a little cable out to a small screen to simulate that processing power, because we don't have any smartphones that are that powerful today. And so by doing this and kind of cobbling together what we can sort of barely do today, we can really kind of take a, a better understanding of what's going to be possible and commercially feasible tomorrow. What might cost $1,000 today will cost $100 in a couple of years' time. This notion of having interactivity everywhere is a wonderful concept. This is sort of why we put computers in our pockets, is we want to have computational capability, so information and information retrieval, communication and so on, with us at all the time. You can have kind of a personal display, kind of like a heads-up display that covers your eyes and it augments your vision, or you can actually directly project onto the environment with projectors. What I really like about the second approach is that by having it embedded in the environment for everyone to see, not just yourself, you can actually have kind of a shared experience that everyone can participate in. So it's not that I see something and you don't, or I get an augmented experience that's different than yours, is we can actually have something that we can all walk up to together and I can see that you're using an augmented surface as opposed to just a blank wall. And I can understand that you're doing that. I can understand if you're interruptible. I can also come over and help and see what you're doing and say, hey, what are you working on? Humans like collaborating. We like walking up to things and grabbing whiteboard markers and working together. And I think there's a danger of losing that if we go to totally virtual. So rather than having it just be a private augmented reality, I like this notion of having a physical kind of augmenting the real world around us and making that powerful. We also ask ourselves this question of, well, what does it mean to have tools in a digital medium. You hold a hammer in a very particular way, or a camera, or a scissors, and how you hold it gives you an affordance for using that tool. And so a lot of the research we're looking at is how do you make touchscreens have better modality by capturing more interesting and powerful dimensions of touch. It isn't just a matter of pure computer science. There's a design component, there's a social science component, there's a cognitive science component, and really only if you understand all of those things are you going to make something that's truly awesome.